Hi everybody, I'm Adam Burney. Some people call me dad, some people call me that guy, some people ask me for help, you never know. Uh, today I'm going to read you Ada's Twist, Scientist, written by Andrea Betty and illustrated by David Roberts. So let's do this. Ada Marie, Ada Marie, said not a word until she turned three. She bounced in her crib and looked all around, observing the world, but not making a sound. She learned how to climb and made her big break with a trail of chaos left in her wake. She ran through the day chasing each sound and sight and didn't slow down till she conked out at night. Her parents were frazzled, but they tried not to freak as Ada grew bigger and still did not speak. Clearly young, clearly young Ada with lots in her head would have something to say when it ought to be said. That's just what happened when Ada turned three. She tore through the house on a fact-finding spree and climbed up the clock just as high as she could. Her parents yelled, Stop! As all good parents would. Ada's chin quivered, but she did not cry. She took a deep breath, and she simply asked, Why? Why does it tick, and why does it talk? Why don't we call it a granddaughter clock? Why are there pointy things stuck to a rose? Why are there hairs up inside of your nose? She started with why, and then what, how, and when. By bedtime, she came back to why once again. She drifted to sleep as her dazed parents smiled at the curious thoughts of their curious child, who wanted to know what the world was about they kissed her and whispered, you'll figure it out. Her parents kept up with their high-flying kid, whose questions and chaos grew both as she did. Even Miss Greer found her hands were quite full when young Ada's chaos wreaked havoc at school. But this much was clear about Miss Ada Twist. She had all the traits of a great scientist. Ada was busy that first day of spring, testing the sounds that made mockingbirds sing, when a horrible stench whacked her right in the nose, a pungent aroma that curled up her toes. Zowie, said Ada, which got her thinking. What was the source of that terrible stinking? How does a nose know there's something to smell? And does it stink if there's no nose to tell? She rattled off questions and tapped on her chin. She started at the start where she ought to begin. A mystery? A riddle? A puzzle? A quest? That was the moment that Ada loved best. Ada did research to learn all she could of smelling and smells, both the stinky and good. One hypothesis Ada thought could be true. The terrible stink came from dad's cabbage stew. She tested and tested, but soon Ada knew it was time to come up with hypothesis too. Then zowie! The stink struck again, just like that. Hypothesis two, it's caused by the cat. The cat couldn't make such a stink on its own. It needed perfume and some fancy cologne. So young Ada tested. The test was a flop. She started again, but her parents yelled, Stop! Ada Marie, Ada Marie, to the thinking chair now. By the time we count three. Enough, said her mother. That's it, said her dad. Her parents were frustrated frazzled and mad. Why? Ada questioned. Her mother said no. What? Ada queried. Her father said go. You've ruined our supper. You've made the cat stink. Enough with your questions. Now sit there and think. She looked at her parents. Her heart turned to goo. Poor Ada Twist didn't know what to do. She sat alone by her... She sat all alone by herself in the hall 
And Ada, once more, could say nothing at all. And so Ada sat, and she sat, and she sat, and she thought about science, and Stu, and the cat, and how her experience made such a big mess. Does it have to be so? Is that part of success? Are messes a problem? And while she was thinking, what was the source of that terrible stinking? Ada Marie did what scientists do. She asked a small question, and then she asked two. And each of those led her to three questions more. And some of those questions resulted in four. As Ada got thinking, she really dug in. She scribbled her questions and tapped on her chin. She started at why, and then what, how, and when. At the end of the hall, she reached why once again. Her parents calmed down, and they came back to talk. They looked at the hallway and just had to gawk. No patch of bare paint could be seen on the wall. The thinking chair was now the great thinking hall. They watched their young daughter and sighed as they did. What would they do with this curious kid? Who wanted to know what the world was about, they smiled and whispered, we'll figure it out. That's what they did because that's what you do when your kid has a passion and heart that is true. They remade their world, now they're all in the act of helping young Ada sort fiction from fact. She asked lots of questions, how could she resist? It's all in the heart of a young scientist. And as for that smile, smell, what can Ada Twist do but learn all she can with her friends in grade two? Will they discover the stink that curls toes? Well, that is a question. And someday, who knows? The end. Hello, I'm Christine Foltz, and I'm going to read to you One Grain of Rice by Demi. It's a book about a little Indian girl. Long ago in India, there lived a Raj who believed that he was wise and fair, as a Raj should be. The people in his province were rice farmers, and the Raj decreed that everyone must give nearly all of their rice to him. I will share the rice safely. I will store it, the Raj promised the people, so that in time of famine, Everyone will have rice to eat, and no one will go hungry. Each year, the Raj's rice collectors gathered nearly all the people's rice and carried it away to the royal storehouses. For many years, the rice grew well. The people gave nearly all of their rice to the Raj, and the storehouses were always full. But the people were left with only just enough rice to get by. Then one year, the rice grew badly, and there was famine and hunger, and the people had no rice to give to the Raj, and they had no rice to eat. The Raj's ministers implored him, Your Highness, let us open the royal storehouses and give the rice to the people as you promised. No, cried the Raj. How do I know how long the famine may last? I must have the rice for myself. Promise or no promise, a Raj must not go hungry. Time went on, and the people grew more and more hungry. But the Raj would not give out the rice. One day, the Raj ordered a feast for himself and his court. As it seemed to him, a Raj should now do now and then, even when there is famine. A servant led an elephant from the royal storehouse to the palace, carrying two full baskets of rice. A village girl named Rani saw that a trickle of rice was falling from one of the baskets. Quickly, she jumped up and walked beside the elephant, catching the falling rice in her skirt. She was clever, and she began to make a plan. 
At the palace, a guard called, Halt! Thief! Where are you going with that rice? I am not a thief, Ronnie replied. This rice fell from one of the baskets, and I am returning it to the Raj. When the Raj heard about Ronnie's good deed, he asked his ministers to bring her before him. I wish to reward you for returning what belongs to me, the Raj said to Ronnie. Ask me for anything, and you shall have it. Your Highness, said Ronnie, I do not deserve any reward at all, but if you wish, you may give me one grain of rice. Only one grain of rice, exclaimed the Raj. Surely you will allow me to reward you more plentifully, as a Raj should. Very well, said Ronnie. If it pleases your highness, you may reward me this way. Today you will give me a single grain of rice. Then each day after, for thirty days, you will give me the double of the rice you gave me the day before. Thus, tomorrow you shall give me two grains of rice. The next day, four grains of rice. And so on for thirty days. This seems still to be a modest reward, said the Raj. But have you? But you shall have it. And Ronnie was presented with a single grain of rice. The next day, Ronnie was presented with two grains of rice. And the following day, Ronnie was presented with four grains of rice. On the ninth day, Ronnie was presented with 256 grains of rice. She had received in all 511 grains of rice, only enough for a small handful. This girl is honest, but not very clever, said the Raj. She should have gained more rice by keeping what fell in her skirt. On the twelfth day, Rani received 2,048 grains of rice, about four handfuls. On the thirteenth day, she received 4,096 grains of rice, enough to fill a bowl. On the 60th, 16th day, Rani was presented with a bag containing 32,768 grains of rice. Altogether, she had enough rice for over two full bags. This, this doubling adds up to more rice than I expected, thought the Raj, but surely her reward won't amount to much more. On the 20th day, Rani was presented with 16 more bags of filled with rice. On the 21st day, she received 1,048,576 grains of rice, enough to fill a whole basket. On the 24th day, Rani was presented with 8,388,608 grains of rice enough to fill eight baskets, which were carried to her by eight royal deer. On the 27th day, 32 Brahma bowls were needed to deliver 64 baskets of rice. The Raj was deeply troubled. One grain of rice has grown very great indeed, he thought, but I shall fulfill the reward to the end, as a Raj should. On the 29th day, Rani was presented with the contents of two royal storehouses. On the 30th and final day, 256 elephants crossed the Providence province, carrying the contents of the last four royal storehouses, 536,870,912 grains of rice. Altogether, Rani had received more than one billion grains of rice. The Raj had no more rice to give. And what would you do with this rice, said the Raj with the sigh. 
Now that I have none, I shall give it to all the hungry people, said Rani. And I shall leave a basket of rice for you too, if you promise from now on to take only as much rice as you need. I promise, says the Raj. And for the rest of his days, the Raj was truly wise and fair, as a Raj should be. The end. Hello, I'm Tom Alonzo, Chair of the Lunenburg Select Board. Today I'll be reading Frederick by Leo Leone, also illustrated by Leo Leone. All along the meadow, where the cows grazed and the horses ran, there was an old stone wall. In that wall, not far from the barn and the granary, a chatty family of field mice had their home. But the farmers had moved away. The barn was abandoned and the granary stood empty. And since winter was not far off, the little mice began to gather corn and nuts and wheat and straw. They all worked day and night, all except Frederick. Frederick, why don't you work, they asked. I do work, said Frederick. I gather sun rays for the cold, dark winter days. And when they saw Frederick sitting there, staring at the meadow, they said, and now, Frederick, I gather colors answered Frederick simply, for winter is gray. And once, Frederick seemed half asleep. Are you dreaming, Frederick? They asked reproachfully. But Frederick said, oh no, I am gathering words, for the winter days are long and many, and will run out of things to say. The winter days came, and when the first snow fell, the five little field mice took to their hideout in the stones. In the beginning, there was lots to eat, and the mice told stories of foolish foxes and silly cats. They were a happy family. But little by little, they had nibbled up most of the nuts and berries, the straw was gone, and the corn was only a memory. It was cold in the stone wall, and no one felt like chatting. Then they remembered what Frederick had said about sun rays and colors and words. What about your supplies, Frederick, they asked. Close your eyes, said Frederick, as he climbed up on a big stone. Now I send you the rays of the sun. Do you feel how their golden glow? And as Frederick spoke of the sun, the four little mice began to feel warmer. Was it Frederick's voice? Was it magic? How about the colors, Frederick? They asked anxiously. Close your eyes again, Frederick said. And when he told them of the blue periwinkles, the red poppies and the yellow wheat and the green leaves of the berry bush, they saw the colors as clearly as if they had been painted in their minds. And the words, Frederick? Frederick cleared his throat, waited a moment, and then, as if from a stage, he said, Who scatters snowflakes? Who melts the ice? Who spoils the weather? Who makes it nice? Who grows the four-leaf clovers in June? Who dims the daylight? Who lights the moon? Four little field mice who live in the sky. Four little field mice like you and I. One is the spring mouse who turns on the showers. Then comes the summer who paints in the flowers. The fall mouse is next with walnuts and wheat, 
and winter is last with little cold feet. Aren't we lucky the seasons are four? Think of a year with one less or one more. When Frederick had finished, they all applauded. But Frederick, they said, you are a poet. Frederick blushed, took a bow and said shyly, I know it. Thank you for watching Lunenberg Storytime, the books we love. If you'd like to get involved and become a reader, we'd love to have you come into our studio and read a book that you love. Our contact information is lunenbergaccess at gmail.com. So send us an email today and let us know if you'd like to become a reader.